Okay, um, I think we're on to the presentations by the uh, different section representatives that are here today. Um, Nancy Hawkins, are you going to start with family law? I believe so. Thank you. Rex? Sounds good. Thanks. Um, first, I want to thank Kevin for his presentations. As always, they raise questions for me, which I'll deal with separately. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make clear that, the, as Kevin said, that the chart is not accurate with regard to the family law section. Family law section is one of the most active sections in the Bar Association, and we do take a lot of pride in that. Uh, we do all of the things that are on that list. We do have a listserv. We do CLEs. We also do annual new member, um, new attorney trainings. We take people right out of law school, teach them how to do motions, how to do discovery, do all sorts of things. And we revamp that periodically. This year it's being significantly revamped. Um, our work with the legislature is uh, vital to our work. We make, we do, we track sometimes a hundred bills in a session, um, certainly dozens. And we uh, identify areas of concern Sometimes we testify with comments uh, and we work closely with the legislative affairs manager with that. Certainly sorry to hear that fewer and fewer sections are um, testifying. And I think that is because there are some restrictive policies that should be revisited. The family law section in particular works with the administrator of the courts and others about forms that help pro se litigants, uh, that help lawyers, that help judges, so that there is um, continuity with the forms with regard to family law. Family law is probably one of those topics that touches every family, uh, every BOG member or certainly family members of BOG members uh, and even Supreme Court justices and their families. Uh, divorce, child support, these are important conversations, important life events. And we take our role in carrying people through those difficult events very seriously. I will take um, one exception to um, something Kevin said, which is that the section uh, provide a lot of member services. And, and while we do in one respect, uh, we, we take our role actually as serving the public, serving the courts, serving this legal system. Our seminars are not about how to build more money, how to get more uh, income, how to reduce costs so that lawyers can make more money. Family law lawyers in particular probably make less money than anybody except maybe the lawyers on the um, low bono list who we also work with. But our seminars are about how to teach lawyers, both newer lawyers and more experienced lawyers about new areas of the law, new tax developments. Uh, and we, we work very hard to see that lawyers are educated on all the topics that they need to know. And we do that not because it helps the lawyer, although it, of course it does, but it's because it helps those clients. We teach lawyers how to work with interpreters. We teach lawyers how to um, work with different communities of color. We teach lawyers how to recognize the differences, of, the differences of issues in, uh, in the King County area like somebody has a pet or something online somewhere. Um, so we work to ensure that the issues that 
are are important in King County don't control how lawyers in rural counties handle their cases because they are very, very different at times. Family law section takes its role of being involved with other aspects of the Bar Association very seriously, not just for the benefit of our section, um, but for the benefit of all sections, because believe it or not, governor meetings are not the most interesting things in the world. And reading, for example, I think it was 894 pages for next week's meeting, not the most interesting reading either. Although Tara does a great job of making it as interesting as it can be, uh, which is not much. Um, but we do that and then sections share that information. There is a section leaders listserv and there's also a monthly phone call or now Zoom call that section leaders voluntarily participate in in which we share information such as what's the budgeting process that the bar goes through and how does that affect section. So family law kind of takes on a role along with others, along with the other three speakers you're gonna hear from in a minute as sort of the, um, oh, uh, you know, the mothers, the parents of other sections to learn about how the bar association in general operates and how it affects sections and uh, for want of a better phrase to kind of keep you on your toes uh, on issues that affect sections. We provide historical knowledge. For example, when, when family law section started, the first time a staff member told us when we started, it was maybe 20, 25 years wrong. Not, this number may be correct now, but um, we, pr we provide historical uh, information about any number of aspects because when I look around the room, the Board of Governors, um, there's an awful lot of people that haven't been around in the Bar Association as long as the four speakers that, that you're going to hear from, uh, the, myself and the other three. We form alliances with judges. We speak to the judges' associations. Uh, we form, form alliances with legislators so that they ask our opinion before they drop a bill because every legislator that's had a divorce in the family wants to drop a bill that's gonna fix things for their son or daughter or son-in-law or whatever. And we do our best to try and comment as to whether those bills uh, are needed or not needed. Should we remain a, um, an integrated bar? Uh, uh, I believe strongly, the family law section uh, believes strongly that we should. And why is that? To, so that we can continue doing the things that, um, that I've been talking about and the things that your other three speakers will, will tell you about. Uh, we have a role, it's a vital role in the organization. It's a vital role in the state of Washington. Um, we do our best. Um, we want to continue to do our best. Uh, a lot is made about the CLE fund being self-sufficient. Well, I think sections are self-sufficient too as a whole. We, um, I don't consider 17 cents off somebody's calculation to be not self-sufficient. And of course, as you know, we've always had a, some complaints about how those calculations are made anyway. Uh, but sections perform a vital, real, hands-on role in the practice of law. We need to keep on doing it. We wanna do it under the label of the Washington State Bar Association because we feel that is a strength for us. Um, we've worked hard to be educated about the structure issues and we feel that we can, be, we can justify our existence within that structure. Thank you. Any questions for our representative from the family law section, Nancy Hawkins? Past President Shaketti. I do have a question, but um, it really addresses, it should be addressed to all of the um, different uh, present presenters. So I'd rather present it at the end um, and then um, get a wider perspective of uh, responses. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I think we're up to um, 
our representative from the solo and small practice section, Kari Petrasek. Thank you very much. It's great to be here and see all of you today. So yes, as indicated, I am speaking on behalf of the solo and small section, small practice section. Um, so there, like Nancy was indicating, our section um, has been around longer than the time indicated on the spreadsheet that um, Kevin showed. But as he also said, we were known as a different section prior to then. Um, so we are going with the 1989 um, year as when the solo and small practice section was officially um, formed. So we are quite an active section as well, similar to family law, but not to as great an extent. We provide a minimum of six mini CLEs or webinars that are free to our members every year. They're really well attended. Um, and as I indicated, they're free to members, but we also have a lot of non-members who attend. And so this is a great source of revenue for us because they're charged a nominal fee to attend. And in fact, last year we um, greatly exceeded the amount of revenue that we expected to get from these mini webinars due to the number of people that we had attend. Um, in addition, every year we do a solo and small firm conference in partnership with the state bar. This teaches lawyers how to run an efficient office on a small budget, how to more efficiently use technology, how to market themselves and other relevant topics to solo and small firm attorneys that they wanna hear about related to their practice setting. Typically, we don't do any kind of substantive law topics because we leave that to the actual um, sections such as family law or um, real property and trust section and, and the other substantive law sections because they're more the experienced people to be able to talk about that. Um, we also have been participating in the mentor link mixers that are hosted by the state bar every year through the new lawyer outreach program. And we also look for other sections to partner with to do a CLE with. Um, last year, we partnered with the low bono section and did a, a mini CLE with them. Also prior to COVID, when we could actually get together in person more easily, we've attended career fairs at the law schools in Washington where we review resumes and speak with law students interested in going into a solo or small firm setting upon graduation. And that's definitely an activity that we hope to um, continue doing and resuming in the near future. Also, um, we are contacted every so often by the state bar legislative staff person about a legislative issue that might affect solo and small firm attorneys. And when we are contacted, we reach out to our membership for comment and we always provide some kind of reply to that. Um, in the past, gosh, probably I'd say close to a decade, we've hosted an annual night at the Mariners game with the pregame social. Even last year during COVID, we were able to do the Mariners game part of it. We didn't do the social part, but we did the Mariners game and had a decent turnout for that. And we also host a few social events um, during non-COVID COVID times, obviously, each year in areas outside of the Seattle area where we usually gain a fair amount of people to that. Um, we always encourage new and young lawyers to attend those events as um, we see this as a networking and potential mentorship opportunity for um, new lawyers in the solo and small firm field that may need um, information and help from more seasoned solo and small firm practitioners. One thing that we did in 2020, right after the start of COVID, we responded quickly to the COVID lockdown by hosting approximately 20 weekly roundtables dealing with the issues our members are dealing with, such as working from home and not meeting with clients in person. Those roundtables were very well received by our participants and were attended uh, with large numbers each and every week that we did that. We also have a solo and small section members only page that can be accessed off the State Bar website that our electronic communication subcommittee continually updates with new content that keeps the page relevant and has useful information for our members, including um, blog posts and some generic forms that people might be able to use. 
And then um, similar to the family law section, we also have a very robust listserv that our members enjoy using to share ideas. They ask questions, they share product information about, you know, like the best scanner to use. Um, and they make other comments relevant to the practice of law. Um, our listserv is one of the things that our members often say is probably the best, me best member benefit um, of being a member of our section. Um, you know, historically speaking, I would say one of the biggest tensions that our section has had with the bar, and this really um, gave rise several years ago when the issue was brought up, but even again now somewhat, is the discussion about breaking the sections off from WISBA. Um, our section definitely sees the benefit of remaining an integrated bar, and we are definitely not in support of the sections being separated from the state bar. Um, there have also been tensions over the elections and the process for elections. Since the state bar provides the service of conducting the elections, we obviously understand the desire for uniformity in the process amongst the sections, but we don't feel that, um, that, that the staff or anyone should um, interfere with um, who the candidates might be, the process for determining who can run and so forth just that you know, this bar could just basically ensure that the dates for the process are known and um, sent out to us so that we can comply with those regulations. And our section has also um, been somewhat um, upset about the fact that the bar seems to want to exercise um, control over our section's reserves and how we should be able to spend it or what should be done with that. Um, our executive committee strongly feels that the state bar should have no say over our reserves and certainly not be allowed to take from our funds. I'd say one of the challenges that we've experienced is the problem of constant turnover in the section's administrative positions, especially recently. We've struggled to have any sort of continuity with our assigned staff person, as we've had each for only a sh really short time in, recently, in recent years, and then we've had to break in someone new. That being said, all of the staff that we've had has provided wonderful support for all of our webinars and programs along with promoting our events. So while there has been a lot of flux with the staff, they've always been supportive of us and our mission and our activities. For both large and small sections, an integrated bar really helps with all of these routine administrative tasks behind the scenes for many of our events. And like the family law section, we feel that our section is, a, and frankly, all sections serve a vital role in the state bar in that we can work with the bar to provide relevant and important CLE content for the membership. We have a more um, hands-on, feel for what our, the members of our sections want to see, uh, what they want to hear about, and what they want to know about. And so um, by having us work with the bar, such as our solo and small firm conference that we have every year, we can, buy, we can provide more relevant contact and um, information uh, to our participants in the program. And I think that that helps everyone in the long run because it'll generate more revenue both for the state bar as well as for us if we provide the relevant contact and information that um, our members want and so they will attend. And that's all I have. Does anybody have questions for uh, Ari Petrasek? No questions? So then we're gonna move on to our representative from the corporate council section, who by the way, is also the governor elect for uh, district nine of the board of governors. Congratulations, Kevin Fay. Floor is yours. Um, I've just unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about the corporate council section. Um, I have been a member of the corporate council sections executive committee since 2004. Uh, the section itself was started by Dick Mangert and some of his uh, colleagues. Back in the day, 
to address the issue that in-house counsel are somewhat different than the rest of uh, the members of the bar. Um, the substantive law we deal with, the emphasis is often very different, uh, even from corporate counsel in some of the larger law firms. Uh, we in-house counsel have to worry about corporate governance, data privacy, uh, human resources, uh, perhaps more than any, any outhouse counsel would. We also have to be wary of non-Washington law. Uh, the California Transparency and Supplies Chains Act, for example, requ requires companies of a certain size to, uh, to put notices on their website about uh, where, they, where they buy their, uh, their supplies. Um, and again, it's not a Washington law. Uh, so we, we have more of a uh, countrywide and even worldwide focus. Um, but aside from the, the substantive law, the ethics that um, apply to in-house counsel are very, very different uh, than lawyers in private practice. Um, so for example, uh, if it's the end of the, the two year cycle and you have to get your CLE credits in, um, most of what corporate counsel would hear don't apply. You know, we don't worry about conflicts because we have only one client. We don't have to worry about who owns the client files because it's the client. Um, we don't have IOLT accounts because the business people never allow us to touch any money. Conversely, we have our own ethical dilemmas that most outside counsel won't. Um, for example, who is the client? What do you do when a vice president comes into your office and asks you, you know, write a lease for his apartment? Or might come in and say that, golly, we might have done something illegal. Um, you have to pull out the up John and make clear that your client is the company, not the individual. He needs separate counsel, blah, blah, blah. But obligations can be very different. For example, if you're in-house in a public company um, and you find that there is, uh, has been some securities fraud, who do you tell? You know, with up the chain reporting, you know, you're not going to get that. So because, uh, thank you for allowing that little discourse, because we are a little different, um, the corporate counsel section has basically does two things. We provide continuing legal education to our members that's relevant to their practice. Uh, we have three quarterly dinners a year. Um, you get a dinner and one hour of relevant uh, continuing legal education, may or may not be ethics. And in alternate years, we will have a full day corporate counsel institute uh, with a full day of uh, substantive and ethics training that is relevant to in-house counsel. And in alternate years, we offer a half day ethics seminar for in-house counsel, again, dealing uh, with issues that are relevant to people in our particular practice group. The second thing that corporate counsel section does and does well is networking. Um, it's very easy for a corporate counsel to sit in their office and not talk to anybody. Um, it is useful to be able to talk to other people who do what we do to know, get some ideas, bounce ideas off of, um, know how to call, get referrals to outside counsel. Um, now, because of the structure of the Washington State Bar, the corporate counsel section is not limited, the, the membership is not limited to corporate counsel. Um, our membership includes people who used to be in-house. Um, it includes people who are in private practice who want to be in-house. It also includes outhouse counsel looking to get hired. Uh, I personally have worked with lawyers in 140 countries, but for the corporate counsel section, I wouldn't know anyone in the private bar in the state of Washington. That helps me in knowing who to call if I have a particular legal issue. So the networking between corporate counsel and the other membership and with each other 
is possibly the most valuable thing that the corporate council section offers to our membership. We were asked to discuss historical tensions with the bar. Well, the biggest one we've had, of course, goes back to the section's policy work group, which um, some member of our executive committee took as a blatant, a blatant attempt to steal our money. The corporate council section is pretty much self-funding. We have the lowest dues of any of the sections at $20. Out of that $20, we get about a buck and a quarter. Um, that does not sustain. Uh, historically, pre-COVID, uh, we made enough money from selling uh, very popular continuing legal education classes where we can carry uh, about a $50,000 operating, about a $50,000 reserve that would cover our operating costs uh, for the next year, which we have been very careful to tend. Um, I will take an aside here and I'll echo what uh, Ms. Petrasek said earlier. We feel very strongly that our reserves are ours. Um, the reserves are the result of money raised by our section uh, through continuing legal education that we have put on um, and have paid the Washington State Bar uh, in fees to put those on. We should be the sole owner of that money and the sole people who decide how we are going to spend it. Now, we could argue that attention is how we are required to utilize WISBA services for what we provide to our membership um, today, we could do it cheaper, cheaper ourselves with the resources we have available. Not the amount in our reserve, but uh, say uh, capabilities that we can borrow from the, the companies that we work for. While we could do that, we won't argue for it because we recognize that uh, going alone would be quite myopic. The Bar Association does add value, um, gives us a structure, um, you know, it gives us adult supervision uh, while we think we know what we're doing. Um, very helpful to have folks who uh, can give structure to help put your, your presentations on. And let's face it, the section leadership while today may have alternative resources, they may not have alternative resources in the future. Now, with that said, even if the WISBA didn't add value, we'd still support the integrated bar. So switching to what we think, or I'm sorry, what I think about the integrated bar. Um, it's very interesting to me, this, this conversation about voluntary bars because in-house counsel already have voluntary bars. Um, for example, the Association of Corporate Counsel um, has a Washington chapter, and I am on their board too, or have been on their board. Um, it is limited to in-house counsel. It's very expensive. It's $500 a year, uh, which means that people join it only when other people pay for it, like the company you work for. The ACC is substantive resources available online uh, that are much better than what you can buy separately uh, from LexisNexis or uh, other Thomson Reuters or, or other providers. Um, they have info packs on you know, what to do in an HR uh, issue when you're not an HR lawyer. Um, it's ideal for the solo or small law department uh, so these resources can be available uh, for in-house counsel who have to answer questions that are not in their area of expertise. Because, but in spite of being ideal for the solo or small law department, with the volume discount of membership, uh, most of the members of the ACC are from larger law departments uh, with a hundred lawyers or more. Um, they get in for free and most don't show up. Um, so it's uh, while while it is a a great bar, there's not as much um, activity in it 
as you would find in the corporate counsel section. Then there's, there's other available uh, voluntary bars, uh, such as the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals, which uh, uh, are aimed at helping the unique needs of public companies and those who support public company boards, and they geek out about that. With that said, if you took the membership of the ACC here in Washington and the membership of the corporate council section and overlap them in a Venn diagram, you, you would find that there's very little overlap. Very few of the ACC members bother to join our section. And most of the corporate council section are not members of the ACC. Um, we, we see that the integrated bar provides substantial value uh, in structure, calendaring, budgeting, um, making our services available to our membership um, that would not be available in a voluntary bar. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for uh, our representative, Kevin Fay from the uh, corporate council section? No questions? Okay, then we're gonna move on to uh, Randall Wynn, who is uh, representing the World Peace Through Law section today. Yes, thank you, governors. Uh, I represent the World Peace Through Law section, although today I'm speaking only for myself, uh, not for anybody else, based upon 20 years of being an officer for the section and participating in other section. I'd like to touch briefly on three points, education, geography, and history. First, education is the prime activity of our section. Our state has 3,000 new residents, Afghan refugees settling here because they supported our people in their country. We discovered at the end of December that they had a lot of legal and practical needs that were not being addressed. So on January 27th, the WSBA through our section hosted an educational program for over 180 attorneys and others welcoming Afghan refugees and educating us on how to support them with special immigrant uh, visas, resources through DHS, and so forth. Think about what the bar did for these new neighbors of ours, a great service to the public, made possible only because our section has the support of the WSBA. As was alerted, alluded to earlier today, the bar staff handles the back office things, technology, administration, registration, while sections handle the content. This is a great partnership that really works. We, we do a lot of programs, monthly CLEs, an all day spring program. Our programs tend not to have commercial value because you know, no one's gonna get rich serving uh, special immigrant waivers. But I like to think that we serve the cause of justice, promote the, uh, equal rights under law and all those things which we as a profession are dedicated to. Because we can do this only in cooperation with an integrated bar, I urge you to continue maintaining the integrated bar, tinkering with it as required. Uh, as for geography, in the bad old days of three to five years ago, most of our programs were held in Seattle. They're in-person programs because that's what we could do. But of course, most members of the WSBA don't live in Seattle, a city I love, but we have members who are in other states and uh, places where it's just not convenient to come here. Well, that's all changed because the bar staff has put together a wonderful program supporting our webinars. So we can not only serve lawyers and therefore the public throughout our state and beyond, we can hear the voices of WISBA members and the public everywhere. Also, a lot of our issues are federal in nature, as my friend from the corporate law section, uh, corporate counsel section alluded to, there are a lot of things that are not Washington state law. 
in two weeks, the lamp section is doing a program on court martials. And I'm, I'm fairly confident there's nothing unique about Washington State refu uh, residents that we need to know about court martials. It's uh, federal. Therefore, we have started marketing our programs to attorneys in other states for a couple of reasons. The most important, of course, is that promoting justice is our job everywhere. We're a great state and a great nation. And while our focus is necessarily on Washington state, if we can promote justice everywhere, that serves us as well. Also, to be practical, we want their money. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the prudent use of member dues if we can bring in people from out of state. But it's very hard for sections to figure this out individually. We're still trying to figure out how to get our programs approved in California or some larger markets. It would be nice if we had some action on reciprocity so we did not have to take extra steps. This is something that the WSBA can do more effectively than we can as individual sections. And as you consider what an ideal bar may be, I urge you to consider reciprocity and joint action in cooperation with other states. Finally, we were asked to comment on past frictions. And while I'm, I'm reluctant to look in the rearview mirror, uh, it is helpful to look at that section's work group where we can learn three things. Uh, the first thing I was gonna talk about was the money, but my friend from corporate counsel covered the money situation thoroughly. I, I would just wish I had said that. So let's pretend I did. I would like to add that squabbling over money is no reason for a divorce. We can make it work. But number two, this surfaced a substantial issue in institutional memory. A lot of members of the board may not be familiar with what all went on. And if we want to find out, well, we do not have access to the archives of uh, what WSBA list serves. In other list serves, I believe the family law list serve has this facility. Nancy can correct me. If you want to look at something that happened two years ago, you just go to the archives and look at two years ago. But if you want to find out what the conversations were about the section work group many years ago, you have to hope someone saved it privately. I feel this is something that should be worked on. There's a technological solution to it. I don't know what it is, but I urge the board to look into that as part of designing an ideal bar association, a bar association that, that we deserve in the 21st century. Finally, that work group surfaced an issue concerning memorializing motions in the minutes. When we asked to find out, well, what is the scope of the work group? Where was it authorized by the board? We were told to go back and read the uh, 600 page narrative of what happened during a three day bog meeting. And somewhere on page maybe 237, halfway down, there's a paragraph that started talking about budgeting. And if you read through the paragraph and onto the next page and halfway down where the paragraph finished, there was a sentence at the end that said, well, we've authorized their work group to talk about sections. And then on went the narrative for another couple hundred pages. And we were told, well, if we didn't know this was gonna happen, that's our fault for not reading them 600 pages. Now, to be fair, board minutes now are much better, just a different planet entirely. If you look at them, they're very readable. Thank you very much. But I urge as a best practice that the minutes should include a bulleted list with the exact text of every motion passed. Yes, this is redundant with the narrative, but it gives good notice of what the board authorized. It gives clear authority to act on that authorization. And, and, and come on, we're lawyers. We like words. We like precise words. We like a clear record of the precise words that we intend so we can provide a good model to how other organizations should act. So I urge you to consider this reform to make us work better. It's all about making us work better, not, not just for us, but for the public we serve, millions of people in Washington state. 
3,000 refugees who are our new neighbors. They are served by the WSBA because you support our sections. We need an integrated bar, which is geographically diverse and transparently run, so we can continue to serve. Please make that possible. Thank you. Any questions for Randall Wynn? Uh, Governor Abell. Thank you, Mr. President. Not so much a question, but just a comment to Mr. Wynn. I want to thank you, sir, to you and your section for your efforts on behalf of the Afghan refugees. Um, that reflects well not only on the section and this organization, but the entire profession. So thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation today. Well, on behalf of the section, uh, thank you for your kind words. We'll do more. Um, I know that uh, Governor Shaketti has, or past President Shaketti has this overall question. Do you want to hear from the other questions first, or do you want to do your question? Uh, um, I'd like to hear from Mr. Fay, who okay. also has his hand up, but other All questions right. first. Would be Governor fine. elect Fay. Um, I would also like to uh, give thanks to uh, Mr. Wynn and his section for what they've done in Afghanistan. And um, I'm bringing my hands in anticipation of an equally daunting task that's ahead of us with potential refugees from Ukraine. Um, I would like to uh, also second his, his motion on having the text of uh, resolutions in the minutes themselves. Um, and I'm, this is from my background of writing minutes for public companies for decades. I am astonished that the text of resolutions are not in the minutes, um, that they, they really don't exist outside the minutes. The minutes are the record of what happens um, going into uh, ancillary documentation to, to find the text of, of resolutions passed by a board just boggles my mind. Um, I would not yeah, I, I would echo uh, Mr. Wynn saying that is a best practice, but I, I don't think it's the best practice. I think it's a fundamental necessity of how how uh, minutes should be written. Anything else uh, from Governor Lec Fay? Still have your hand up. Oh, sorry. Okay, past President Shaketi, I think you're next. Thank you, President Tollison. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for presenting uh, this morning. Um, I've had the pleasure and privilege of serving as a liaison to the corporate um, section and the world peace through law sections and uh, uh, very much enjoyed my involvement um, both times as District 3 Governor from Southwest Washington. Um, my quest yesterday, uh, Executive Director Nevitt, uh, Governor Boyd and I went to at the invitation of the Pacific County Bar Association uh, to talk about this process, the ethos structure uh, examination um, and what we're doing and report to them. And there was one gentleman who um, uh, talked with us about, you know, this is an easy solution. We should just let the sections go do their own thing. They would be able to testify in the legislature uh, however they want. They wouldn't be restricted by political activity. They could go and do that. They wouldn't be tethered by the money issue with the WSBA. Um, and there wouldn't be that tension anymore that we've heard about. And some of you have already kind of answered some of my question about um, why being a part of the WSBA is important. Um, but I'd like uh, more information about that because we were hit with that yesterday and says, why isn't this an easy solution? Why we just make them 501c3 uh, entities, they go out, they can do whatever they want and I don't have to pay for it. So if one of you could talk a little bit about that, I would appreciate it. Well, I can start. Um, if the section were to spin off and be uh, a self-funded 501c3, I believe it would cease to exist. Um, we 
again, uh, we don't derive a great deal of economic benefit from the bar association. We get a buck and a quarter per member from the fee that we charge. And we're basically self-funding as we are. But the bar offers a structure where uh, the membership can be open to folks by check, clicking a box. Um, it offers a structure on how we conduct our meetings, a structure in, in how we uh, give off our CLEs. Um, that's very valuable um, that we would otherwise have to do ourselves or purchase from somebody else. Uh, I also believe that if the sections are off by themselves, um, one or more may be subsumed into some of the other voluntary bar associations, most notably King County, um, or not. It just would, they just would not um, survive. My opinion. Any of the other section representatives want to uh, share? Well, I'll jump in as well. That that was going to be my comment as well, that we aren't funded by the general membership. Not only do we fund ourselves with our separate uh, section member dues, but we turn around and generate both product in terms of CLEs and and uh, desk books and course books that make money for the Bar Association and have made money for the Bar Association in the hundreds of thousands of dollars over the history of this organization in the last 50 years. Um, and, and it does, and the, the calculations that Kevin gave us don't even address the, the voluntary contributions. You know, I write a chapter for the desk book. I don't write it as the family law section executive committee member. I write it as a lawyer. And there are other people, there are many people who've been on the family law executive committee who also write chapters or who have written chapters. And the Bar Association has made hundreds of thousands of dollars selling those things. So, um, there's always going to be comments at these listening tours, but they generally come from people who don't have the understanding of the finances that we do in this room or the people um, watching via Zoom do. Um, I, we, we are not sucking the lifeblood out of the Bar Association. We are vital parts of the Bar Association and more than make up for the structure that um, Kevin talked about. And a lot of that structure, uh, I can't remember who brought it up. You, you probably were pleased to see that I didn't talk about all the tensions with the Bar Association in the past, because I've brought it up before. But you know, a lot of this structure has was imposed upon sections. You know, when do elections happen? You know, what's a deadline for submitting something? Th those are generated by staff. They're imposed upon us. Even the elections issue could have been, you know, we think it would be beneficial for the bar if all the elections happened at the same time. What do you think about that? And then sections could say, gee, this is why we like to do it at a certain time, why it works best for us. And then you try and reach a compromise. No, those things were just imposed upon us. Those are the sorts of things that caused tensions in the past. Same with, of course, the effort to take the section fund balances that we worked very hard to both earn and preserve. Looks like Kari has her hand up. Yes, uh, Representative from um, the small sol solo and small practice section, Kari Petrasek. Yeah, and I just wanted to piggyback on what Ms. Hawkins just said. In response to the question that another member asked you, if we weren't there to help produce the CLEs and other content through desk books and stuff that we do help with, it would be upon you to do that. And it would be a loss of revenue to both the bar. And if that content wasn't being made, then what would that person say if the bar was no longer able to offer them those resources? And so I think that's an important thing to keep 
in mind is that without us, <laughs> there's a loss in two ways, both to the bar as well as to the general membership as a whole. Okay, now did you have a follow up question, uh, Governor Shaketi? I mean, past President Shaketi, or you just have your hands? Still well, up? Yes, one quickly, one um, um, follow up question. And thank you for that. That was all very helpful. And I'm putting my list together so that I'm better able to respond at our, our next uh, uh, meetings with other bar associations. Um, some of the things that you had mentioned with the tensions, and maybe there would be better ways of, of implementing um, some of the programs and policies of the WSBA. It uh, reminds me of a couple of days ago when we, the Practice of Law Board met with the um, Supreme Court and there was a question about uh, ethos and how that would affect the board. And we'll get into that a little bit more this afternoon. Um, but Justice Madsen also mentioned that part of the process that we should look at perhaps would be the governance report from um, several years ago. And I'm wondering if all of you would feel that uh, within that analysis, if we added that onto our um, our schedule, if that would be uh, an appropriate place to talk about some of the tensions and how to alleviate those. Well, we're happy to hear any suggestions from the Supreme Court and address them with a little more thought. Um, but I also fear that focusing just on tensions makes it look like there's a hundred reasons why sections should be split off instead of fighting for the existing structure as being justified for a hundred good reasons and uh, and that restructuring is not for us is not required under existing case law that the errors or practices of other states are not things we do and we should be proud of that um our uh, representative from the corporate section did you, did you want to respond to uh past president shaketi's question well i i want to uh vigorously agree with what was just said. Um, focusing on the tensions is, is probably not going to be helpful uh, in the endeavor that we are looking at now. There's always going to be tension um, because herding cats is hard. Herding lawyers is a whole lot harder. Um, we are trained to argue with each other and let's face it, lawyers would rather die than stop talking. Um, yeah, there's going to be tensions, but there also needs to be structure. And it, it's been worked out. And maybe we'll do it different next time. But to say that it didn't go 100% touchy-feely smooth doesn't mean that the structure we have needs to be blown up. Thank you for those comments. Okay, um, Governor Pertzer. Yes, thank you. I, I got a couple of questions because I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing a couple of different things. From Ms. Hawkins, if I understand you, you're saying that the family law section is, in the slang term, is a cash cow for the WSBA because of all of that it produces. And from Mr. Fay, I'm hearing that if it's not a part of the mandatory bar, that, that the corporate section is not going to make it. And so I'm, I'm a little curious as to um, why you believe that um, you couldn't survive on your own if it was a voluntary bar as opposed to mandatory. Ms. Hawkins, as I understand you saying that the bar is a convenience, but it's not a necessity. Mr. Fay, I'm hearing you say that the, the mandatory bar is a necessity uh, and you, have, you want to be autonomous uh, and you want to have control of your finances but you don't believe you could be successful if you were not part of a mandatory bar because you couldn't make it financially. So I'm not entirely certain I understand that. So if, if all four of you perhaps could I explain I didn't say that. it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make it financially. People wouldn't, would not join it. 
There are, uh, again, why? there why is are that? voluntary bars for in-house counsel. I know that because I belong to two of them. I am on the board of one of them and have been on the board of another. And the overlap of membership is not there. You can join the corporate counsel section of the Washington State Bar and avail yourself of the opportunity for continuing legal education by ticking a box and paying 20 bucks. To join a voluntary bar association of in-house counsel, you got to pay 500 bucks a year. And that, quite frankly, may be pretty hard for a solo in-house counsel person to do. And, and I'm not, um, I, I, I'm not uh, making this up. I have the membership lists. I know who belongs. There were very few people in the section that belonged to the ACC and vice versa, which makes no sense to me. So it's not that, gee, I think this is what will happen. I already know what will happen because we've done the experiment and seen the result. I guess, um, Governor, there's a difference between small sections and larger sections. And a section that has 50 members or 100 members, uh, I think, would have a very difficult time try being separate. It puts too much work on the few people willing to step up. I mean, most, most lawyers want to work in their field. They want to do substantive things. They don't want to come to meetings. They don't want to talk about budgets. They want to do their work. And um, and play a role in a in a larger process. We see a value to all of the sections continuing, not just let's um, come up with a structure that means that you know four or five larger sections make it and the others don't. But that's not good, and it's not good for substantive reasons, not just for those smaller sections that would have difficulty. But let's say the Supreme Court has proposed, someone presents proposed rule changes. The Bar Association wants to comment on those rule changes because shouldn't, shouldn't they? They're the Bar Association for God's sakes. So where are they gonna get the substantive knowledge of a particular subject to, uh, to make those comments. You, you will not, with the Board of Governors, have a broad enough level of expertise on all subjects. You know, when I look around, when the, when the room is full of governors, as it used to be, there might be one person doing family law or none. There might be one person doing estate planning or none. The, only, the, the way you get your substantive content to reach a, a, an organizational decision is through the expertise of sections. If we're separate, you're gonna be asking us, I hope, to come in and give you opinions. Why not keep us? There's no reason not to. Um, so I hope that answers the concerns you had. Okay, um, let's see. Uh Kevin Faye, did you have another comment on this whole question before I move on to our, our, our representative from the World Peace Through Law? Or did you just uh, have yes, I, I want to second the emotion. And I also <laughs> want to point out that most lawyers do not receive discipline during their uh, career. The vast majority of lawyers don't. The vast majority of lawyers in the state of Washington, they're only interaction with the Washington State Bar Association is writing a check every other year, taking mandatory CLEs, which the sections provide, and the, their uh, participation in the sections. Other than that, you know, there is no interaction with the bar. You know, it's just out there and they take the money and they don't do anything. So, um, for the vast majority of the lawyers here in the state of Washington, the sections are the bar. 
Uh, Randall Wynn, you have your hand up. Did you want to comment on that too? A couple of points. Uh, we all know there's some statistic like 50% or 90% of small businesses fail within a year or three years, some huge number. And frankly, I don't know a business model that says that most of our sections would not fail as businesses, you know, nonprofit businesses, but failures nonetheless, uh, without, uh, if you just went off and, and, and went on your own. Partly that's because our volunteers are interested in content, law, right? Not in back office stuff. Uh, we're not interested in doing whatever it is that Rex does to make our webinars work. Uh, and we are certainly not interested in hiring people and running human resources and all that. That's why we pay member or, or member due section or whatever that the share is. I mean, we squabble about it, of course, because, you know, money. But but we get, we get good value and we are accepting of paying dues to have all that back office stuff taken care of. We just don't have a business model to be financially value, valuable, uh, viable. I don't see why we should break what does not need fixing. Sections provide value to the court and to the public as Nancy and others have pointed out, huge value. And basically section membership is a way to volunteer to serve the public by paying for the privilege. Let us continue to pay for the privilege. Okay, uh, our general counsel has been patiently waiting. Thank you. So I wanna put on the table just a couple of other issues um, that I think it might be interesting to hear from the section representatives about. And one of them is, is section participation a way to develop future WISBA leadership? Um, no one has mentioned that, and I am curious about that. And secondly, this may be, well, I'll just say what I'm going to say. So in the bylaws, it says that sections or entities of the bar created and tasked to carry on the work of the bar. And then if you look in the court rules, uh, GR 12.1, the regulatory objectives. So these are um, in regulating the practice of law, what our court looks to. A few of those are meaningful access to justice and information about the law, legal issues, and the civil and criminal justice system. Um, efficient, competent, oh, sorry, that's not the right one. Um, accessible civil remedies for negligence and breach of other duties owed, and then it talks about disciplinary sanctions. Um, transparency regarding the nature and scope of legal services to, to be provided. So I'm just wondering, is there a role for sections in assisting the Bar Association with those communications? And in both of those things that I've mentioned, how do you think those would change if sections were separate? Any response? Uh, I think there are a couple questions there. Um, as far as developing leadership for the bar, uh, absolutely the sections do that. Um, I will be the fourth uh, member of the Board of Governors that have come out of the corporate council section in the last six years. Uh, Paul Swiegel, Jim Dunn, and Bryn Peterson have all uh, served on the executive committee, the corporate council section, before running for the Board of Governors. I have run for the Board of Governors uh, because Bryn and Jim suggested it. Um, absolutely, the sections are a pipeline for leadership for the Board of Governors. I know that from personal experience. Um, I am sorry, the, the second half of the question uh, was not particularly clear to me, so I don't have an answer for that. Sure. So I can try and clarify it. I'll just summarize. So the bylaws point out that the sections are 
WISBA entities and the job of the sections is to assist the WISBA with the work of the WISBA. And part of the WISBA's work uh, is in, you know, in carrying out our regulatory functions, we are to keep in mind and to operate within the regulatory objectives that are in the court rules. And specifically one of those, um, sorry, I'm flipping back to it here, um, mentions um, meaningful access to justice and information about the law, legal issues, and the civil and criminal justice systems. So my question really is, you know, is what the sections do part of that? And so therefore, oh, interestingly, I, I is was... there some kind of tie between, between the two sides? And, you know, would, if you think that exists, would it, would it make it different if you were not part of the bar, if you were sec separate? So I'm just trying to get at, you know, yes. in both in both things that I've raised, would it destroy those things, I guess, is what I'm saying, or diminish those things if the sections were separate? Um, uh, forgive me, uh, General Counsel Shanklin, I am a little bit deaf. Um, so uh, when I said I didn't understand, part of that was not, not hearing the question. Yes, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, we are required to have continuing legal education to know substantive law uh, as, as part of our obligation to member of the bar. The sections provide uh, that information. That's all we do in the corporate counsel section is give relevant, uh, provide relevant continuing legal education to our members. That's what we're all about. Now, if the sections were uh, kicked to the curb, who is going, how is the bar going to fulfill that function? Randall, when you have your hand up, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, two points. One is that, uh, as, as you said, education is a lot of what we do. And by making recordings of our continual, continuing legal education products available to the public on our webpage, we help educate the public as to the, the, the laws and stuff that we discussed. Uh, one of our things that we do is we make links to that those programs accessible to our speakers so they share with their colleagues in the public uh, I, I know for a fact that uh, dozens of members of the public have reviewed our january 27th program to learn about the existence of special immigrant uh, uh, visas uh, there are many other ways in which i think our section in developing content for lawyers also helps educate the public and that of course is in addition to the value to the public of having educational lawyer, educated lawyers to serve them. Now, could this in theory be done by an independent organization? Well, I, I suppose, I mean, the ABA exists and so forth, but the cachet of the WSBA, it seems to me, operates as a certain quality control check. When someone views this piece of content on the bar website, they know it's not just some internet rando going on about something, it has at least had some quality control and some uh, indicia of reliability. I feel this is valuable and would be lost if our section were no longer associated with the WSBA. You know, I would add a comment as well that, um, you know, we're here, in, and it's an odd feeling to be in this position where we're basically being asked to justify our existence. And that um, feels somewhat odd, if not demeaning, given the hard work that we put out. Um, but we're here doing it. And I guess I would ask a couple questions back and, I, and I'll briefly com come back to Julie's question though. Who serves who? 
is really the basic question. Do, does the bar association serve us or, or are they making a gift by letting us exist within the bar structure or do we exist to help our members and to serve this organization that's been around for so long to make it better to make it stronger to develop leadership um, if it were although frankly sometimes what we do is so mind numbing the idea of going up to the bog is like you know hit me with a stick don't let me do that and i'm sure it's that way for many many other people but i can't see the board of governors doing the substantive work that sections do and with and with all due respect the level in in the years of infighting between ev almost every single board the level of animosity the the level of personal attacks between board members. We don't see that at section levels. We don't see that between sections. Look at the wonderful um, speakers that you've heard from, from three other great sections. When we talk, we talk together, pros and cons. We learn from each other. There's no nastiness. There's no backstabbing. There's none of the infighting that, again, we've seen in board after board after board for many, many years. I was here early before the doors were open. I was looking at the pictures of the past presidents, awful lot of white men for decades and decades. But I, and that was, it was of course wonderful to see the diversity, although Rajiv has longer hair than all the women that have ever been the president of the Bar Association, that was noteworthy. But also, you know, I saw two, and I certainly don't know the discipline history, but I saw two pictures there of people who've been disciplined by the bar uh, and or sued and or prosecuted. And so it's not like the Board of Governors is on some cloud and, we're, and then we should be down here begging for our existence. The Board of Governors has its own issues, the staff in the past particularly have had their own issues. But we're not here talking about what kind of Board of Governor changes should be made, what kind of staff changes should be made. Instead, sections are having to come up here and justify our existence to stay within structure. And um, I would hope that people would realize that we are the ones that are carrying out actions for uh, the substantive actions of the Bar Association to educate the public, educate lawyers, make our legal system better. We're the ones meeting with judges uh, and talking about forms and talking about um, technology. And, and I don't mean we, my section, but it's the people outside of this room that are doing lots and lots of things to make this system better. And as a lawyer who's been around for 40 years, it's there are many aspects that are better than it was when I started. Security, technology, diversity. We're involved in those things. Um, Randall Wynn, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, just briefly, and I'm trying not to be facetious, but I, I've served on a bunch of uh, WISBA committees and joined a lot of WISBA sections. And the difference between them, I mean, they're both entities created by the BOG, sometimes by petition, but created by the, authorized by the board for a purpose. And the main difference between them is that you pay to join a section. So maybe we should just change the name section to committees. The family law committee is tasked with providing le continuing legal education on family law members. Uh, would that alleviate people's concern or is there a principal reason otherwise and and that's all okay um it's i don't see any other hands up uh it's 12 18. an hour Yeah, would everybody be willing to come back at one to keep us on track? Because we're a little, we're, you know, 
20 minutes into the lunch hour. Is that acceptable to everybody? Okay, so we uh, will have a, take a short lunch break and reconvene at 1, 1 p.m.